Welcome, everyone. I think we can get started. It's 9.31. I can see our number of attendees um, coming in and joining us. Um, so welcome to today's webinar on the future of spiritual and religious tourism, hosted from uh, Victoria University of Wellington, Teringawaka in New Zealand. Very excited um, you can join us today. Let me quickly make sure I'm not forgetting anything important to tell you here. There we go. So my name is Ina Reichenberger. I'm a senior lecturer here at Victoria University of Wellington. My specialty is in tourist behavior. I have nothing to do with um, spiritual or religious tourism whatsoever in the slightest. So I'm really, really excited today to hear from the speakers we've invited to get some insight into how religious tourism, pilgrimage, spirituality will play a role in tourism moving forward post um, COVID-19. We are welcoming two excellent um, contributors and speakers today. We have um, Dr. Kevin Griffin here, who is a senior lecturer in tourism at the Technical University in Dublin. Kevin's an expert, really, in religious tourism, amongst many, many other things on his CV. He's the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Religious Tourism and Pilgrimage. He's also editing a book series with Kevin on religious tourism and pilgrimage. And he's going to share with us his thoughts on how pilgrimages especially are perhaps going to develop moving forward, especially now that through COVID-19, we've all been connected digitally and virtually a lot more. As our second speaker, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Jayon Jo. Um, she is joining us from Swansea University in the UK, where she's a lecturer in tourism. And she too is an expert in religious and especially spiritual and wellness tourism. Um, Jayon is on the editorial board of Kevin's aforementioned Journal of Religious Tourism and Pilgrimage. Um, she's been doing a lot of work around especially the role of spirituality and is going to share with us today her thoughts on spirituality in a post-COVID tourism world. We were also hoping to welcome Dr. Sarah Romani from Victoria University of Wellington today to contribute a perspective on the future role of meditation and tourism. Sarah, unfortunately, is unable to join us today. I'm very sorry to miss her contribution to this webinar. Um, it does leave a little bit more time for us, of course, um, to discuss um, Kevin and Jayon's contribution through the Q&A version. Um, our attendees, um, thank you so much for joining us. You're probably quite familiar with the setup and the structure of a Zoom webinar by now. I think we've all spent enough time in these settings. Um, please uh, contribute your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You'll also be able to see the questions contributed by other participants of the webinar and are able to upload these if you find them especially interesting. And we'll come through the Q&A section after our speakers have completed their presentation. And essentially, we're going to work our way down from the top um, amongst the most popular questions moving there. And we'll hopefully have um, sufficient time today to really start um, a good discussion around this topic that is really going to be probably increasingly relevant um, in the future of tourism. So thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, there was a slide with a picture of me. Hi, that's me. Um, we're going to kick it off straight away and with um, Dr. Kevin Griffin's contribution on the 22nd century pilgrimage with a question mark. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I um, hope everyone can hear me okay all the way from Ireland, to New Zealand, which is what a phenomenal concept. Um, it's obviously it's late at night here as it is for, for Jay on as well. So uh, forgive me if I'm a bit... Uh, a little bit scatter has been a very long day, including a, a talent show in the local school my son was performing in. So a bit, bit, bit of anxiety getting here on time. To, to, I was hoping they finished on time, which they did. Um, so I think perhaps on this title slide, the most important thing is the question mark. Um, you know, what is 22nd century anything? Um, uh, one of my neighbors tells a really interesting fact his son has started a job as a game designer, an online game designer, a very, very, very brilliant young man. That job didn't exist when his father got his first job. The father was a kind of a, a, a developmental engineer. That job didn't exist when his father got his first job. And his father was a, a, a car mechanic 
and that job didn't exist when his grandfather got his first job. So, you know, that to me tells me how, how the world changes, you know, the generation after generation are doing things that have never been done before and, and never seen before. So when we talk to something, talk about something as kind of strange and unusual as uh, pilgrimage, if you can go on, um, I, can I take control of the slides or do I just tell you next slide? The next slide. Thank you. Um, so, what is pilgrimage? I've, I have a slide here, which kind of, you know, it, it's difficult in in, in uh, the length of time we have to cover anything in a huge amount of detail. But um, what I want to talk about is the very broad breadth of religious tourism and pilgrimage. I'm using the word pilgrimage, but just as a, 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 a just one of the terms, you get spiritual tourism, church tourism, religious tourism, and there are subtle differences. And I'm terrified with Kieran Shind and Daniel Olson logged on here with. To to get bogged down in definitions, we could be here for hours um, between a bunch of us. But what I'm just trying to get people to think about is the broad sense of, as the, the very um, paraphrase quote at the bottom says, a form of tourism driven by a given faith or set of beliefs. And whether that is, you know, I, I don't go in as far as secular tourism and visits to Elvis Presley's grave and things like that. But, you know, we, we'll stick with the more church and religious focused uh, elements of it. These have been motivating and driving people to travel for thousands of years. Um, you know, we've monuments in Ireland which are older than the pyramids, uh, Newgrange, which is a megalithic tomb. And people, it, it, you know, as much as we can figure out what happened, they were traveling there for religious reasons to celebrate uh, the winter solstice. Um, and you know the, the starting of a new year and you know people have been traveling to these places some people suggest perhaps the begin beginnings of civilization are religious based where people gathered in groups to do certain things uh, of a religious nature right the way up then to modern um you know leisure activity with a religious focus which i, I don't have on this left hand side this slide but one that fascinates me is cruises to do with religion you know, cruising around the Mediterranean to visit all the ancient Christian sites. And, and if you think about the map of the Mediterranean, all the, 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 the fundamental foundational locations to do with the Bible are located around the Mediterranean. Do it on a cruise, you get to visit the sites, say some prayers, attend some services, and have a historical tour all in one. So, you know, religious tourism, pilgrimage, traveling for religious purposes is you know, a global phenomenon. And all the way from all different types, from the accidental general tourist who walks into a cathedral to the person up at the other end of the scale here on the right-hand side, the fervent religious tourist or pilgrim who is traveling specifically for a religious purpose. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, tourism, we're talking about pilgrimage, religious tourism. Um, the World Tourism Organization has recognized the importance of religious tourism and has held a number of national, international, global conferences, webinars, seminars. Um, so they're enthusiastic about religious tourism, but as I put in brackets there, what about the statistics? And again, I know some people who've logged on um, are very aware of this wonderful statistic that we, th we hear. So if you, if you listen to this for a second, there are 300 million international pilgrims or religious tourists every year. And this number is rapidly growing. That is repeated and has been repeated for the last 15 to 20 years. No one has updated that 300 million. No one has updated the doubling of that to 600 million if you include domestic pilgrimage and religious travel. Um, so it drives us crazy. And at a World Tourism Organization event, I, I, I cornered the person who first put that in print by the World Tourism Organization. I said, where did that come from? And I was told where it came from. Um, uh, Kevin Wright in America came up with the number. I've asked Kevin Wright where to get the number, and he says it's a guesstimate. <laughs> so, you know, we, it, it, it kind of frustrates me. So, I'm, this is my kind of foundation, what I'm trying to say here, which is this is an enormous activity. It's global. We've events with 10, 20, 40, 60 million people traveling to them, but we still haven't quantified it properly. So, that, that's one of the weaknesses. Um, if we can go to the next slide, perhaps. So, when we look to, the, to, to the, the, where we're at, where is tourism, where is travel at at the moment? Gosh, we, we all hope that it's starting to come out of, of COVID. In, in Western Europe, we're doing quite well. We've got out of COVID. I, I went to Spain a couple of weeks ago with my children. We traveled. We wore masks on the airplane. We came back. We all got there, there and back safe. So um, David Edgell's 
important world tourism issues for 2021. COVID was very core to that, and it still is, and it will be for the, for the future. Um, other issues there, I think if, if you go through them, if I had three hours to do it, I could go through that step by step and tell you where I think religious tourism fits. I think it fits in almost every one of those. It has an in, it, It's influenced by or it influences almost all of these issues. I found this really interesting list here by Condé Nast, which is their, what they think the future holds. You know, and I'm not a futurist, but uh, I understand what you do is you talk to experts, you see, you, you get the, the views of experts and you can do all sorts of data collection and analysis. But one of the ways is to look at these, um, you know, world experts somewhere like Condé Nast. And they say, you know, that these are the 10 steps or the 10 future trends. And again, I think religious tourism and pilgrimage fit really well into this. Um, the idea of the, the rebooting of long haul travel, you know, people going on pilgrimage, you know, Muslims from all over the world going to Mecca, um, personal development retreats, you know, the, the, the travel of people, particularly to India for, for meditation and yoga. Um, I'm sure Jay on will touch on that a little bit. Extreme expeditions, I'm not so sure about that, but some of the pilgrimages I've read about and researched about are pretty extreme. You know, 30 days of walking with a backpack on your back when you, you know, and people doing it who've never done that sort of trip before. So maybe not extreme in, in the true sense of word. All inclusive luxury is interesting because a lot of pilgrimage travel has tagged on an inclusive luxury piece as well. So people, um, my own parents did a pilgrimage to, to Italy many, a good few years ago now, and they went for four or five days. They, they traipsed around Italy to see where Padre Pio had been, now Saint Pio. And then they had five days on the Amalfi Coast where they discovered uh, this beautiful drink um, which they brought home and, uh, yeah, uh, Sambuca. <laughs> they discovered on their, their first trip to Italy on their pilgrimage but in a beautiful hotel. So this idea of balancing pilgrimage with luxury. I'm not so sure about the cosmonaut training camps. I don't know how that fits with pilgrimage. Hallucinogenic healing, I'm going to skip, but the idea of healing using alternative methods. I didn't believe that was in it, actually, until I came across it. Um, and the work workations of going places. Adventure hiking, very clued in or linked in, I think, with pilgrimage. A lot of destinations worldwide are developing pilgrimage trails, hiking related. And then streamer locations, basically people going to places where they stream from. That's my understanding of that one. Um, so lots of things happening in tourism that I think pilgrimage fits in with. I'm just going to stop on the next slide very briefly, just to point out that the sustainable development goals, three of which are specifically tourism related, so inclusive sustainable economic growth, sustainable consumption, production, sustainable use of oceans and maritime resources. The first two of those, definitely there are pilgrimage implications there where, you know, sites, historic sites, heritage sites um, linked to religion uh, and their long-term sustainability are huge of huge interest. And quite a lot of pilgrimage sites, it's because their heritage is being protected because they're ongoing pilgrimage sites. And then the consumption and production, we could get into discussion on, you know, what are the, the, the factors and features of, of sustainable consumption and production, producing locally, consume locally, and local pilgrimage sites, I think, fulfill that quite well. The next slide then, um, I just have a, this question which I'm throwing out about COVID at, to people to think about. You know, a lot of the literature on COVID and our, the impact it had and how we're recovering from it are monetary focused and materialistically focused. Um, the emphasis is on the short term is on the economic downturn. The long term is on developing, delivering safe procedures for future possible events. Um, so the time, energy, resource has been spent on avoiding, detecting, monitoring, and managing COVID. But there's been very little literature, research, focus on, you know, the role of the personal human impact, despite the fact that that's something we've all dwelled on as, as individuals. How has COVID affected me and my family and my, my, how I look at the world? So I think that's something, maybe not in the 22nd century, but in the, in the near future, people are looking at this. Um, I was talking to a, a priest recently who was looking at how the church has evolved, his particular congregation, where people are now still staying online who are comfortable with it, um, and older people in particular who, who, who would have, you know, had found it difficult to get to, to a weekly service or weekly mass, are now quite happy to be online on their iPhones. Um, you know, that kind of personal spiritual idea. So if you don't mind the next slide. Um, one of the really interesting developments, there's lots of different examples of this, is how 
sites all over the world of a pilgrimage and religious tourism nature have used virtual technology to engage with followers so you can get a prayer said at the the western wall in jerusalem if you send an email and a donation to this organization top right is a temple in in india where you can 24 hours a day watch prayer services uh knock catholic shrine in Ireland, i had to throw that one in you can watch live services and recordings and the great mosque in mecca there's multiple you know online systems where you can watch it live you can watch recordings you can tune in for for daily prayers um and these are sites these there's a new tiny selection of the ones all over the world who have discovered the value of technology for for engaging with pilgrims um and again that brings the theory of kind of theoretical ideas of what is a pilgrimage do you physically have to travel? There, were, there are religions where, you know, traveling for pilgrimage is seen as being unnecessary because the travel haven't, happens internally. And uh, a lot of religious sites over, over COVID have thought about that. And I think this is something particularly for the future. And then the next slide, which is my last one, I'm kind of galloping through, but if we can, if we have time, we may tra travel back to some of these ideas. So what I've been thinking about is, you know, what is the role of proxy or virtual pilgrimage? And it goes right the way back. There's no evidence for something like the fourth century. But in the 15th century, there was guidebooks written about pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And the purpose of writing them was so that people could live through these books, live the pilgrimage that they could never go on themselves. You know, and you had to give up your life for years to get to Jerusalem from, from England, for example, you know, you, the travel, the danger, the cost, all this kind of thing. Um, and there were actually professional pilgrims. You could hire someone to do the pilgrimage for you. What a cool concept, um, which reminds me of being at a religious tourism event in, um, in Portugal and seeing somebody walk into uh, um, the cathedral with a camera walking around the place. And I was thinking, how rude is that? Until I realized they were talking to somebody who was somewhere else in the world and they were showing them the religious site. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking how rude, how awful, you know, they're going back to something that's been happening for centuries. So on the right here then, you know, when we're talking about things like overcrowding and, you know, overconsumption and all these sorts of problems, is there an actual role? And I love these guys on the top right here in the cinema or something using their their, their head headsets, and they're, yeah, this they're not wearing earphones in this one. I, I use different photograph where they've earphones in, and you've all these immersive technologies. You know, are we going to see a future where this is an alternative as opposed to going to places where there's capacity issues? You know, Mecca is now at four around, around four million people. And you know, there's a lot of concern over pollution, over stress of the environment. What's going to happen if, if oil prices continue to shoot up and it's not affordable for anyone to travel anywhere? Um, are we going to resort to this sort of thing? Or the, the bottom one there, this kind of virtual environment and how that's going to step forward. So, you know, moving back to what I said at the beginning, you know, this idea of you know, we don't know the current generation, what we're doing wasn't envisaged a generation ago so what's the future going to be what i am fairly certain of though is this, this fine little box here on, on, on the bottom right and that is that there is something in pilgrimage um the religious adherents want to engage in some sort of physical interaction a huge amount is what the turners called communitas which is this idea of a community engaging in an activity and that's part of the religious experience, part of the pilgrimage experience. Um, and whether you're, you know, talking about yoga or you're talking about, you know, circumnavigating the the, the 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 holy sites all over the world, but I'm thinking particularly in Mecca, you know, in in large numbers, there, there's a, a value and an importance which people put in in pilgrimage of, of being with other people. So, as I said, I see technology playing a part, but I don't see it replacing it entirely. And then. The, the other final comment I'd say, I think, is that perhaps there'll be, a, and I, I use the term, and it was edited out by an editor once upon a time on me, where I used the word glocalization. I don't know if you're familiar with that, folks, but the idea of being global and local at once, which sounds completely contradictory, but, you know, I want to travel to this globally important place, but I also want to, to support the local at the same time. Um, so I think that's the, the, the future. So I'll stop at that. I, I don't know if we want questions and chat now, or will we wait to the end, Ina? 
Um, we've got a little bit more flexibility around the time. So first of all, Kevin, thank you very much um, for this presentation. It's been really fascinating to um, consider some of the components involved, especially in the pilgrimage component of religious mm -hmm. tourism. I think um, Daniel Olson posted um, a question in the Q&A that I think might be helpful to answer now before we um, move on to uh, Jayon's contribution today. Um, he says, Kevin, you gave a demand side definition of religious tourism motivated by religion. And um, what would a supply side definition perhaps look like? Or also, does it make sense to create a supply side definition in this context? Yeah, th th well, there definitely is one. Um, you know, the, the, I'm thinking church, particularly older church sites, phys you know, physical heritage um, needs to be maintained. And if you've got, you know, Canterbury Cathedral and you've got to keep it functioning. It's very useful if you can get pilgrims to turn up and pay a little bit of money each um, to support it. Um, Mecca is, is, whether it's supplier demand, I'm not quite sure, but the, the amount of development and growth around the central mosque is enormous in, in recent decades. And the same, you know, some of the, the, the religious sites in India are, are just expanding exponentially to, to, to cater for the millions of people who are, who are traveling. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to do too much marketing, but I'm, I've just recently been proofreading a paper about a, 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 a church in Africa which is, if I remember right, three kilometers by three kilometers in size. Um, that's definitely supply side, <laughs> creating a, you know, an enormous super church. Um, is that supplier demand? You know, de demand follows supply, follows demand. It's a bit of both. Um, how do we get the UN to, the, Kieran Shind is just asking, how do we get the, the World Tourism Organization to provide data? when you have the person who wrote the report that everyone quotes standing in front of you and he says, well, you know, we used his one. Have you heard of Kevin, Kevin Wright? And I said, yeah, he wasn't expecting the answer. Yeah. I've emailed him. I've talked to him. He, he made it up, <laughs> you know, and that's effectively where that number came. And, you know, I know Daniel and Kieran are both tired of seeing that statistic quoted again and again, we all quote it because it's the only quote. It's the only, you know, we're academics. We have to defend our quote. Um, I've gone off and done lots and, you know, trying to dig into that but it's it's a colossal task to try and go country by country to see you know can we identify who's traveling italy and israel i think are the only two um states that that, that statistically record religious travel um yeah i think they're the only two if memory serves me right so yeah, that's, that's when they do that, I, I, I'll, I'll be delighted. <laughs> give us a statistic, give us a fact. With regard to my son's contribution, yeah, he 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 didn't win. He played guitar. <laughs> that that was weighing on me. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm <laughs> so glad I know this now. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, we've got a few more questions um, coming in, but for now, we're going to move on to um, our second speaker today. So, um, Jim, thank you so much for joining us from the UK, where it's also late. I'm glad you've had coffee. I hope it's not going to interfere too badly with your sleep tonight. But you're expanding or rather taking um, Kevin's contribution in a different direction, and you're looking not so much at religion and pilgrimage, but at spirituality and tourism. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Ina. Thanks so much for uh, the invitation to, to Ian as well. And Kevin, good to see you. And it was very interesting to um, hear your presentation. I agree with uh, a lot of the things that you mentioned, especially I'm working on pilgrimage uh, project in Wales now. But anyways, hello everyone. I'm Jeon Che. I'm working at Swansea University in UK. And yeah, it's becoming 11 p.m. here. It's, it's my bedtime. But I had a really, really strong um, three cups of coffee now. So I, I try to be, uh, I hope I try to be um, um, entertaining speaker as usual. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm um, speaking about inclusive and sustainable spiritual tourism features um, in Southeast Asia. And I've been researching on spiritual tourism and a little bit of religious tourism as well subject in the past 10 years. Can you go to the next slide? And um, I had a very interesting experience in 2016 in Chiang Mai, Thailand during my field work. I was uh, investigating how spiritual tourism is beneficial for tourists in Chiang Mai. So I was uh, talking to people uh, who are there for spiritual practices and spiritual tourism. And I noticed that everyone I was talking to was 
uh, actually Western person from Western Europe and US and Australia. And also these spiritual facilities and yoga studios and mindful retreats that I was going to are also kind of ran by Western teachers and Western owners, Western managers. So I was wondering, um, where are the Thai people? And so when I went for the next project to Ubud Bali, I was investigating more on how to spiritual tourism actually impact on local people and community. Of course, in theory, like Kevin mentioned earlier, spiritual tourism, religious tourism, all this kind of, you know, positive, alternative, uh, responsible tourism is supposed to benefit the local communities and help alleviate poverty, reduce poverty, um, create livelihoods and revitalize culture. But unfortunately, when I was doing my field work in Ubud, Bali, I really didn't find that. So, um, so my question is how can we develop spiritual tourism in a more inclusive, sustainable way in a post-COVID world, taking COVID pandemic as a kind of turning point or as a kind of transformative uh, period. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, my talk will be based on my field work in Uber Bali, primarily, and these are uh, some of the findings I, I found from spiritual tourism impact in, in Ubud. So Ubud, if you heard of, it, it became a the spiritual tourism destination in, in Asia and Indonesia because of the very famous film, I Pray Love. It's arguable, but many scholars would, um, would point this out. So this, oh, this small town used to be a rural village, not many tourists, but now the international tourism destination for yoga and other spiritual activities. And what they've done to local communities they have created jobs, obviously, right? But mostly low income jobs for, for locals. And what I learned from my field work also was very sad that um, local people had to sell their properties and land and farms. Um, so foreign investors can build these beautiful, inclusive yoga resorts and spiritual facilities. So, um, is it really benefiting local communities? The tourism boom, spiritual tourism boom, was not really um, benefiting local communities. And actually poor local people have become poorer because they sold the properties, they sold the land, and you know they were getting just these low income jobs as a cleaner or receptionist or, or drivers. And also often these spiritual tourism products and programs are quite disconnected from the local uh, spiritual cultures. And when I was talking to the local people, they were quite concerned about losing the traditional culture due to this over commercialization. Next slide, please. Thank you. And there were actually some opportunities. I met these Balinese local yoga teachers. They used to be housewives. They didn't really have jobs, but they also wanted to have jobs, but they see this spiritual tourism boom. And so they become yoga teachers. They were actually very happy. And one of them, um, Dayu, who has become my friend, she actually opened the vegan cafe because she saw Western people come to Ubud after yoga, they all go to vegan cafe and have smoothies. So, oh, I'm gonna open vegan cafe and sell smoothies. So she actually opened a, a vegan cafe. She was doing well until COVID happened. But next slide, please. For Dayu, it's still very hard to compete with these fancy you know, facilities and vegan cafes ran, ran by actual Western people who know what customers want, who know how to you know, make these fancy vegan dishes and smoothies and come up with the facilities. And these local people who are involved in spiritual tourism, yoga tourism or meditation tourism, obviously had a lack of resources, skills and experiences, also confidence. Next slide, please. And interestingly, when I talked to them, I was asking them, would you like to have financial um, support from the government so you can you know, help with your businesses? But they said, no, we're not very interested in cash support. We want training. We want to do like the other Western people do, like running you know, uh, programs that customers want and tourists want, right? So they said they're very interested in getting proper training they need and they want to learn English. 
And also interesting, they said they want to have access to data and networking opportunities with other local elites and foreign investors and foreign managers. So they know how to run the businesses. So they're very interested in the, the data and training um, uh, aspect, which was very interesting. And even during COVID, you can see in the picture, some of the Western ran uh, yoga studios and speech facilities sustain the business with uh, virtual yoga classes and virtual cooking classes. So some of them sustain the business very well, but these yoga uh, local um, yoga teachers and facilities couldn't because they didn't have the you know, digital skills. Um, so that, that was kind of a big gap um, in this town. Next slide, please. Thank you. So during COVID time, Obviously, or as Kevin mentioned, people might be more interested in meaningful travel, slow travel, you know, something more spiritual um, and go to spiritual destinations in the post-COVID time. I mean, it's still very um, kind of you know, difficult to say when is the post-COVID time, right? And also interesting, I'm in Europe, I feel like we're living in post-COVID time, but whenever I go back to Asia, you know, still not really post-COVID time, and there's a big gap between these two continents, and so that's a different story. But anyways, many experts uh, are also um, arguing people might be more interested in spiritual wellness, um, tourism in the post-COVID time. And there is a there might be opportunities that, uh, destinations and authorities and tourism businesses develop more inclusive, more sustainable spiritual tourism models and programs in the post-COVID time, learning from these previous problems and you know the leakages and trust bubbles. So in the post-COVID time, they can do something better for the local communities uh, and local people as well, not just for you know upper middle class white um, European or American tourists for spiritual tourism. So I think it's it's in a way it's kind of good to pause now to think about this to you know change directions for spiritual tourism development in Southeast it's Asia from now. Next slide, please. So these are some of the suggestions I have, and I also have been discussing with my um, friends in Bali who are running spiritual tourism businesses, and these are some of the examples. So spiritual tourism programs and products should be diversified and differentiated. I mean, if you go to Bangkok, Hanoi, or Bali, or any places in Southeast Asia, you will see very similar repetitive spiritual tourism you know, products, right? Yoga classes, meditation retreats, spa, massage. It doesn't really matter which country you go, right? That's a huge problem, I think. And especially in Southeast Asia, they have very rich historical, spiritual heritage and resources, which haven't been really utilized. And the problem is that the tourism developers are mostly you know, foreign investors who don't really learn from local people about the local unique spiritual heritage and resources. And there's a, again, huge gap in this. So I think in the post, COVID uh, period, these investors, developers, governments, authorities, and businesses should learn from local people and communities about what kind of resources they have, what kind of traditions, heritage are there in the in the each um, location. So they'll be very, very in, important to, to implement and consider. And I feel like we're missing on so much potential and resources for spiritual tourism in Southeast Asia by just providing kind of Western imagined uh, products and programs. And in the post-COVID time, uh, there'll be more maybe uh, demand on nature-based spiritual activities in remote and rural areas. So we can imagine people might, especially spiritual tourists might avoid going to urban locations for spiritual tourism or famous places for spiritual tourism, but they might travel a little bit further to, um, you know, kind of recover from all these lockdowns and stress caused by uh, pandemic and psychologically and mentally and physically recover in a very quiet, tranquil, more authentic places. 
And there might be opportunities for uh, rural villages that have um, high poverty rates in Southeast Asia to utilize this demand to recover from pandemic and negative impacts, also create new livelihoods um, for them for long, for long term. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is my last uh, slide. But of course, that sounds all great. Rural you know, villages or rural um, remote villages will have the advantage of spiritual tourism um, growth in the post-COVID time. But one of the biggest challenges is these rural villages in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, Thailand, or Vietnam, any countries, very, very hard to access to or get to, right? So even though there is a potential resources, a demand, and local people want to develop spiritual tourism, um, it's actually in practical sense, really, really difficult because tourists really cannot get there by public transportation. And I think more governments and author tourism authorities should realize this and invest in um, public transportation um, and infrastructure. And actually, Lao government has been very active in this during pandemic time. They've been investing so much money in road development and new train development that might change the game in the post um, COVID time. I'm very excited to see this, but there should be more investment on infrastructure for rural tourism development, not just even spiritual tourism, but tourism development in general. And also government and authorities should support small uh, spiritual tourism initiatives and uh, businesses based on what they actually need, not just throwing cash at them, but just listen to what they want, need, trainings or marketing trainings or data or networking opportunities, events for them to help them um, develop their spiritual tourism products in a more sustainable and inclusive way. And for my last point, there should be more sophisticated research on uh, spiritual tourism market. Multiple segments, different concepts of spirituality is required. So for example, during COVID time, there have been more domestic tourists traveling uh, to spiritual destinations and sites within the countries. And there is not, just not much data or research about domestic tourist spiritual tourism activities and behavior. And I'm sure Balinese people's concept of spiritual tourism or spiritual activities might be very, very different from Western tourists. So there should be more research on domestic tourist uh, spiritual tourism behavior and preferences as well. And there's, again, there's no one market for spiritual tourism for a country. There's multiple markets, budget travelers, backpackers. So we should just widen the, the scope of research. The previous or existing research on spiritual tourism often focusing on um, you know, like a middle class tourist going to these poor countries for their spiritual activities and that should should be shifted and expanded in the future for researchers like me as well. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Jiyoung. Thank you so much for the Thank contribution. You. It's been really interesting to see, especially a demand side, a supply side perspective to complement um, Kevin's presentation, focusing more on demand and consumer trends. And the Q&As are rolling in. I would like to start with a question from Daniel that I've been asking myself as well. Daniel asks, what is the difference between religious and spiritual tourism if spiritual tourists travel to religious sites, for example, temples? And my thought around that was sort of similar also in line where then the line between spiritual tourism and wellness tourism is being drawn. And what, what conceptualizations do we have available or definitions to make sense of these overlapping yet quite distinct segments? That's a great question. I get this question actually all the time, but um, spiritual tourism can be related to religious sites, obviously, right? But not necessarily. It's a com uh, according to Alex Norman, who is my favorite spiritual tourism scholar. Spiritual tourism is actually about fully focusing on solving my problems during leisure travel, but it can happen around you know, religious sites, but it's not necessarily going to religious sites. So that might be a big difference. So you go to Chiang Mai uh, to learn how to meditate and learn mindfulness, but you might not be necessarily interested in Buddhism. So that might be kind of you know, 
catching the, the, the core concept of spiritual tourism. Would they make sense? Yeah, but I, of course, I, I, this is sorry, this is also interesting that like how Western scholars define spiritual tourism and how uh, my Balinese academic scholars define spiritual tourism has been also deep, uh, different and I'm working on paper with my Balinese scholar friends, but we've been kind of like having lots of discussions on, on what spiritual tourism means, but how she, my Balinese academic friend sees spiritual tourism has been also very, very different from I've learned from um, you know, existing research. So, okay, like Kevin mentioned earlier, it's really difficult to define um, what spiritual tourism is, and it can mean really different to everyone in this room. Mm -hmm. But if I had to um, emphasize one element, that, that might be the difference. And, and, and again, and you mentioned, Ina, that you, you haven't seen much of religious tourism literature, but, you know, if you, the, 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 I have a diagram there earlier showing spiritual to secular. Mm -hmm. And, you know, traditionally there would have been a big belief that you know you can you have to be religious or you have to be secular you know the the more current belief is you know you can fl flip from one to the other on um, you know completely seamlessly somebody for example could be going to learn how to do yoga no interest in spirituality and have a spiritual mm -hmm. experience or you know I, I talked to somebody who did the the Camino to Santiago and they were doing it purely as a, a physical you know, get away from the world exercise. They had no interest in religion. And they had quite a conversion moment halfway through the journey where they met people and talked to them. And they came back, you know, with a reinvigorated religion that they hadn't practiced for 20 years. So, you know, then you hear the opposite. So, you know, there, there's the, the boundaries between the two. Typically, when you talk about religious tourism, it's following a particular religious practices I won't say regulations but you know you're there following a particular faith a particular set of mm -hmm. belief systems um, where spirituality is is um, yeah it's, it's different yeah. Um, but, but yeah lot, lots of overlap yeah and I just added a comment um, from the audience as well authors call this combination of religious self-transformation tourism and spirituality the post-secular mm -hmm. mm. And, and you know, and, and, and you, uh, yeah, anyone who researches this will have multiple kind of. I, I think the, the better, the, the more you read about it, it's one of these things. The more you read about, it, the less you realize you know about it. <laughs> and, and people who have very definitive, you know, hard and fast rules, um, you know, I, I, I don't think we need that too much. I think it's not doing us a huge amount of f favor. Yeah, um, I actually also had a very interesting conversation with my friend who's doing pilgrimage research at the University of Oxford. I asked her, how do you define pilgrimage? And she said her definition is no definition of pilgrimage. And that was it. just kind of, you know, enlightening and turning in a way. She's been researching only on pilgrimage and she said there is no definition on pilgrimage. And that's the definition from her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then have um, two somewhat related questions in the chat as well. Again, for Jeon, we've got a couple for Kevin as well. We'll go back after this, but we're just in the flow at the moment with the spirituality. Um, Kieran says, Jeon, thank you for the fantastic presentation. One question that might be hypothetical, but worth asking is, how would the local Balinese entrepreneurs who now see spiritual tourists as customers deal with the worn out and COVID influenced travelers who might be looking for something else than just the old pre-pandemic kind of spiritual experience? Essentially, really, I think how are local entrepreneurs, how is the tourism industry within these destinations adapting or hoping to adapt to changes induced by COVID-19 in consumer behavior in this segment? So how it they are other just to change in the post COVID time, right? Is it, is it right? Is essentially how are we expecting consumer behavior in spiritual tourism to change post COVID, and what the implications of that for the local um, tourism industry are for the um, supply side? Okay, I mean, of course, I am not a fortune teller, so I cannot you know have a definite um, answers. But I just imagine based on all, all the readings, people might be more interested in going to. Um, 
you know, kind of non-famous rural remote places for for their spiritual tourism compared to before. And actually, this was uh, like happening already in 2018 and 19. So Ubud is very uh, famous for spiritual tourism, but actual like spiritual tourists didn't like the the, the town becoming too famous, too commercialized. So they are going beyond Ubud and going to more rural, small areas. I think that might happen um, in the post-COVID time. People go to more kind of non-famous, quiet place just to focus on themselves. So that, that might happen. And also people um, will look for not just yoga or meditation, but also look for somewhere that offer healthy um, vegan vegetarian diets um, as a kind of kind of package as well. And also people will look for small places where they can learn about their culture or experience the culture um, as well. That, that's just, I, yeah. I, th I, th I think linked to that as well is that there is a, mm -hmm. I think a global drive, whether it's supplier demand driven, is, but we might go back to Daniel's question earlier, to try and professionalize pilgrimage and religious travel a little bit more. So if you think of, I'm thinking of the project you're, you're looking at, Jay, and I don't know much about it in, in pilgrimage in Wales, but you know, I, 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 there's, there's actually a project which I'm tangentially involved in with the southwest, southeast of Ireland and Wales, mm -hmm. looking at a, a, a joint pilgrimage trail. One of the big limiting factors there is and and it's down to the logistics of is there enough accommodation along the route for people to walk from place mm -hmm. to you know which organically grew with the the camino to santiago mm -hmm. and it's set it, it has set the, the kind of the marker you must have cheap pilgrim accommodation every x number of kilometers mm -hmm. and food and and it's becoming you know every, every trail that's developing is looking at can we get the local community to provide accommodation or do we get professional mm -hmm. you know it, it's that, that kind of commercialization and product packaging and all that is becoming quite a challenge for new emerging pilgrimage destinations. Kevin, it's very interesting you mentioned that actually during my project in, in Wales, we learned that there's absolutely lack of accommodation in Wales. And there are too many walkers to pilgrimage sites in the past yeah. two years and now just lack of accommodation and uh, and we've been asking churches to open their buildings yep. as a you know accommodation and have bunk bed and things, and that, that haven't actually happened yet. But yeah, and toilets and cafes and restaurants, yep. just, you know, doesn't meet the numbers of these kind of spiritual workers and pilgrim, pilgrims. So a huge problem in Wales. In line with that, we've got a question um, in the chat from Najee Garebi, who was picking up on some of the pictures that we've seen within M. Kevin's presentation. She asks, and from a consumer behavior perspective, how much do you think there will be engagement in terms of using a virtual reality headset as a replacement for real traveling to pilgrimage sites? Perhaps also in line with balancing demand, overcrowding, and some of the challenges you've just touched upon. I, I, I think, honestly, if you ask me to be, be, be totally frank, and I don't think it's going to affect the, the, the existing pilgrimage practice, model, demand, whatever. I think it's going to create another type of demand. Um, I, I, I reckon that a lot of these sites have been created aren't going to decrease the number of people traveling. You know, but if, if, if you have places, as I said, like Mecca, which you know Muslims have an obligation to travel to if they're able to within their lifetime, if, you know, travel restrictions and um, the number of people in a physical place has to be limited, what's your alternative? So I don't think it's going to reduce the number of people traveling to Mecca, but I think it's going to give an alternative to people who can't. Likewise, you know, you can virtually do all sorts of pilgrimage trails all over the world. Um, there, there, you know, there's been people who have run, you know, do the Camino in your local town by walking you know, walk X amount per day and we'll have a prayer session in the evening. And, you know, that kind of thing has been happening all through COVID, not just for religious reasons, for people who are into extreme cycling, they're sitting in their, their garage on a stationary bike with a, a, you know, a, a television screen in front of them climbing the Alps. You know, that, that doesn't stop someone climbing the Alps when they physically can go there. Um, so I don't think, I, I know I showed nice images of it, but I really don't see it as replacing what was, what's there, but I think it's going to supplement. Is it supplement, supplement rather than supplanter? I think kind of the proper terminology is. Yeah. 
It's interesting that you do see potential. And also, while we're on the topic of consumer behavior, Eliza Raymond says, and really interesting presentations, thank you. What would your recommendation be for spiritual tourists themselves who want to have a more positive impact on their destinations? Which I suppose is a question coming at the time when Jian was just talking about um, the Indonesian context, but could be translated to religious tourism in line with those challenges as well. How to be a responsible religious or spiritual tourist? I, I think it's like other forms of responsible tourism. One, one of the big ways to do it is to do less frequent, longer trips. And somewhere like a you know a twenty day hike across the country, staying in local accommodation, eating local food, is enormously beneficial for a local area, whether it's in Southeast Asia or West Wales or you know anywhere in the world. Um, and there are people that's what they want, you know, whether it's a, one of the the Appalachian Trail in America or the you know a religious trail in Japan, you know, doing that kind of journey. On, on your own feet with no transport other than getting you there and back home. Um, that to me is as sustainable as something like that possibly can be. That's true. And one thing very simple tourists can do, for example, if they go to Ubu Bali, stay in local homestay and go to local restaurants, which tourists don't do in, in Ubu. There's so many nice American hotels. They provide you everything, like you know, like yoga classes, meditation retreats and workshops and vegan cafe and nice smoothies. So they just stay in the, the this um, inclusive resort. <laughs> yeah. And they have a nice, you know, rice farm views. So they don't get out of the resort, but just don't stay there and stay in local homestay homestays and, you know, hang out with the local people. Actually, in Ubu, it's a big problem. There are hundreds of uh, homestays uh provided by local people and there there's just way less demand now so poor people actually losing their businesses because they're relying on their lives on these homestay businesses but because of these american hotels they're losing you know their income sources so yeah that's one simple thing they can do i think thank you we've got um a little bit more time. Um, we also have time to address um, Stuart McDonald's question in the chat, which is looking more at the promotion or the marketing side of religious tourism. Um, saying, I've got a question from a tourism promotion point of view. In Thailand's case, Buddhism is an often promoted facet of the country's efforts, but in Indonesia and Malaysia, the Islamic nature of the countries is underplayed, at least by tourism boards. Do you think this is a missed opportunity? I absolutely think so. Yeah, I absolutely agree with this point, like 200%. I mean, Thailand is a Buddhist country, so they've been advertising the country as a spiritual destination, right? And they, they've been, um, you know, advertising Chiang Mai as a Buddhist destination very well. And Chiang Mai is the most, the most uh, popular uh, places to go for spiritual tourism in Southeast Asia. But Indonesia, Malaysia, yeah, because of this political or religious conflict or yeah. I, I'm trying to be careful here. Sensitivities, but... sensitivities. <laughs> yeah, sensitivities. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Kevin. <laughs> sensitivities. I think the uh, government and authorities haven't been diligent with uh, promoting them as a spiritual destinations, even Bali. So, yeah, there is a big problem and they're definitely missing out huge, huge the potential resources and, and tourism and incomes. So something they Again, really it, should realize. But, but, but I think if we could circle back to what we were talking about earlier, which is the statistics, you know, there are, you know, religious villages, religious tourist attractions being created mm -hmm. um, across Southeast Asia, which we really aren't seeing statistics from. You know, mm -hmm. you know there's Islamic villages where there, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you can go and stay with the, you know, the highest standards of food, of service, mm -hmm all following the correct codes and practices. Um, and particularly from the Western world, we're not seeing that. You know, we, we, we don't get any um, data from that part of the world that, that we can interpret and understand. As I said, if the, if the world, if anyone knows the World Tourism Organization, we should be, you know, absolutely pushing them into looking at this in, in detail. I, I don't think it's as, 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 as the, the questioner asked there, I don't think it's as, um, invisible as, as we think it is, but we're not seeing the data coming through. Um, there, there's quite a bit of marketing and product development happening, um, particularly in Indonesia, 
um, of of individual towns being or locations being identified with temples and mosques and you know being being developed. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're going to bring the Q&A to a close now because we'd still like to hand over just for a minute um, to one of our doctoral candidates, Nan Nguyen. The um, webinar series from Victoria University of Wellington this year is essentially representing or reflecting the areas of research interest of our current doctoral candidates. And we have Nan Nguyen who is conducting her research on future perspectives on um, spirituality and tourism, joining here as well, who'd also like to give a lot of thanks. So Nam, I will hand over to you. Thank you so much for being here today and for giving us some inspiration for today's webinar. Your style, your style. There we are. Hi. Kia ora, I'm Nam Pung, a PhD candidate in tourism management, Victoria University of Wellington. It's my honor to give a word of thanks to them who make the webinar a successful event today. First of all, I would like to thank the speaker, Kevin and Chiyong, for sharing graceful opinion and answering the question about this one. I also would like to thank Associate Professor Ian Newman, my supervisor, for organizing the webinar. Thank you, Ina, Louis, and other members of school management. Thank you to participants for joining us and raising interesting questions. My PhD is about the future of spiritual tourism in the Red River Delta and Northeast Coast of Vietnam in 2050. The webinar shed light on my research and area of interest. The presentation offers insight into how spiritual tourism and religious tourism and pilgrimage could involve in responding to unexpected events from different perspectives. Kevin is about the future of present and the future of tourism of pilgrimage and see how pilgrimage changed under the impact of COVID-19 and with the support of advanced technology. Chiang proposed inclusive and sustainable for the future of spiritual tourism in the South Asia. Changes in society such as advanced technology and the COVID-19 pandemic has changed spirituality, changed the pilgrimage, changed spiritual tourism. Post-COVID-19, Pilgrim a separation form alongside the traditional physical one and spiritual tourism. Engage in I mean, spiritual tourism, become more interested in slow and nature based tourism. This is the pilgrimage and the inclusive and sustainable spiritual tourism could be identified as turning point that set the future of spiritual tourism. The webinar provides valuable and updated material on the spiritual spiritual tourism of which the literature is kept. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you so much. Tina Gato, Tina Gato, Tina Gato, Gata. Nam, thank you so much. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you so much to all of our participants, um, to our attendees, to our panelists, speakers, and the administrative team in the background making sure this actually works for their contribution today and for joining. Our next webinar is coming up in July. So keep an eye on trying it on the exact date. And um, for this webinar, we'll be featuring a lot of showcasing in the area of interest of our doctoral candidate, Eliza Raymond. And the topic will be on researching with children, issues, methods, ethics, and knowledge. So keep an eye out for this. And thank you again for joining. I hope you'll have a wonderful day, afternoon, evening, night, sleep well, depending on where you are. Um, Tina Koto, Kiara, and I'll see you in another webinar, I hope. Thank you very much.